<laughs> uh, well, good morning, everybody. We're excited to be up here for the final morning of Experience Lab 2016. We're the first of a couple panels. Um, so to, to start off, my name is Alex Casillo. As uh, Don mentioned, I'm a senior account manager here at One North. I've been with One North for a little over six years, and so I've had the chance to work with not only Susan and Gerardo, but many of you on implementing these digital strategies that we've been talking about. Um, and so yesterday you heard from One North folks on a lot of topics that aligned with that central theme that Kalev introduced in the beginning of the day of trying to break the bimodal cycle and really embrace more of a consistent endurance cycle, right? Um, but we also heard you know, there was a question, I think it came from over here after Kalev's uh, presentation, and, and the question was, how do we actually make this happen, right? Because it's really challenging. And so the panel this morning, I like to think of it as where the rubber meets the road, right? Um, and that's where Susan and Harard are gonna share a lot of great content, and I have a lot of respect for, for both of them, um, because they've embraced that type of mindset and they've started to spread that throughout their marketing department. Um, but it's not easy, right? They've, they've come up against their fair share of challenges and obstacles, um, and we're gonna talk through that today, okay? Um, last thing before we get started, we really want this to be interactive. We want you guys to feel like you can participate. So uh, we will have some time at the end for questions, but. I would actually rather, if there are questions or if you have your own examples or ideas, shoot your hand up. Um, we can take those during the conversation. Um, if you need a mic, we can, we can get you a mic um, to talk. But we really want this to be open, interactive with everybody. We want it to be a discussion up here, but also a discussion with you all as well, because I'm sure everybody has uh, their experiences and ideas to, um, to provide. So, with that, um, I think we're going to start off with some introductions. So, Susan, would you mind first just kind of introducing yourself, giving your background? Sure. So, I'm Susan Katz. I'm a Director of uh, Digital Marketing with um, Goodwin Proctor. Um, we're a law firm of 950 attorneys uh, in the U.S., Europe, and Asia. Um, and I have been, my, my background is that I spent a good portion of my career in the financial industry in both investment banking and finan financial technology, and I moved over to legal about seven years ago. Great. Thank you. Gerardo, how about you? Hello. Good morning. My name is Gerardo Campos. I work for Navigant Consulting. I'm the director of digital. I manage all the web strategy, email, marketing automation, content strategy and I also manage the graphics team. I have been at Navigant for probably 10 months. I'm fairly new, and redesigning the website was my first cha big challenge. Uh, I actually came from Accenture Consulting, where I, we also redesigned the whole website, so it was very challenging, and when I was interviewing with my boss for this position, the first thing he told me is like, you have to relaunch the website in seven months. I'm like, okay. <laughs> so that was a big challenge. But I, I, that's one of the reasons that I took the job. Uh, I have my, my experience is more on the consumer side. I work for Motorola. I work for a German company called Growy that they do like faucets and showers. So I have a lot of experience on the consumer side. And then on the business to business side, I've just started working with, with Accenture and now with Navigant. Uh, I actually started my career in Mexico City doing advertising and more on the creative side then moved to Chicago, and then uh, when I was at grad school, my internship was at the Museum of Contemporary Art here in Chicago. And my first project was really telling the website. So that's when I started, you know, this is really cool. You can be very strategic, and you can be also very, very creative. So that's when I decided I wanted to do a web strategy. Great, thank you. So yeah, as you can tell, um, different industries, different backgrounds. So. I'm excited to hear the perspectives from both of you. So um, both Goodwin and Navigant, um, and I worked with both of them on these uh, redesigns, but they launched uh, this summer, so very recently. Um, some intense uh, rebrand uh, process that actually led into the redesign um, that happened recently for both of you. So if you wouldn't mind, just kind of paint a picture for um, 
for the audience on, on how that went, um, both, both the rebrand and the redesign. Gerardo, if you, if you wouldn't mind starting, I know you weren't at Navigant during the rebrand, but you're familiar with kind of how that, how that went. So. Yeah, that's correct. So uh, my boss, who is the CMO, he started the whole rebranding project, and it got launched the first day that I arrived at Navigant. So obviously, I, I, when I was interviewing, I was seeing all the old logo, and then on my first day, I see all these different logos and colors, and I'm like, oh, maybe I make a mistake, I'm in the wrong company. <laughs> <laughs> but it, I mean, it, it went great. Uh, that was one of the reasons, the rebranding was one of the reasons that he wanted to relaunch the website like in no time. Uh, initially, what we did was just took the old website and then just changed the colors, like uh, changed the logos. But basically, the back end and the user interface was the same. The only thing that changed was like the colors and, and the logo. However, it was a, a huge, huge change. But again, I mean, he told me, you know, your first priority is relaunching, relaunching the website. And the rebrand was what really led into redesigning the overall uh, website for Navigant.com. Great, thank you. Uh, Susan. Um, so uh, we, we made the decision to rebrand um, because our firm's over 100 years old and you know, it has evolved a great deal over those years. And you know, our strengths are really in things like tech, uh, technology, life sciences, private equity, real estate investment. And so we, needed, we felt we needed a fresh, purpose-driven brand um, to take us into our next phase of growth. So the brand portion of the project took about a year and a half of um, you know, interviewing all of the partners across the entire firm. Now, excuse me, a subset of all the partners across, all the, across the entire firm. Um, but all the different geographies and, and um, uh, business units represented. Um, and then that went into you know, the whole strategy and, our, and design um, choices, which we made the bold choice, and it went through. Um, and um, then, you know, the job was to articulate that brand. Now, our um, our brand launch was coincided with the opening of our new office in the Fan Pier area of Boston. Um, we had been on State Street for over a hundred years, and it was a big move into the innovation district. Um, and we wanted to use that as the um, opportunity to, to launch the new brand. So, of course, by the time all the brand thoughts and everything got um, scheduled, we too had seven months <laughs> to roll out the entire brand, redo all of our digital properties, and hit that date with no, no chance to miss that, that exact date. Yeah. So, uh, I think what's interesting is, I mean, both of you had very tight timelines, right? Um, and so that obviously means that there were some compromises that need to be, needed to be made because the launch date was really a priority, right? And so in order to hit that, um, I know from working with both of you on, on the projects that there were some things that needed to get pushed out. Um, and so I'm curious how that communication was handled. Um, you know, internally with stakeholders, you have a lot of opinions and a lot of people that want their uh, feature or, or thing that impacts their industry or their practice um, to be launched. So, um, Gerardo, if you don't mind talking first, just kind of about that communication. I know you guys put a lot of thought into how that would happen. Yeah, absolutely. So, when I first joined the company and I was talking with like different peers, I will never forget this woman who told me, you know, my best advice for you is always communicate. It's better to uh, over communicate than under communicate. So that's still, I still remember that. So when we were going through the launch, uh, launching the, the new website, we will send communications every single week to the practice marketers. We will send an email on Friday saying, you know, these are the things that we did during this week, and this is all the things that are going to happen in the following week, and this is what we need from you. So it was really more like an announcement, and then at the end. Now, how can you help us out? So we did that to really communicate directly to the marketers, but then my boss, the, the CMO, he actually communicated to the managing directors, all the consultants, and every, all the people at his level. So we were getting the, the communication, or sending the communication from the bottom top, and then Ed, my boss, from the top to bottom. So everybody knew what was going on. 
Uh, we also developed like a group in Yammer called Digital Transformation. And then every single week we will put like an update of where we were with the website and the main milestones that we completed, where we were going, and where we were gonna launch. So we're just really communicating every single time to the company what was going on. And then around uh, probably two months before we launched the site, we developed a video to really start uh, communicating how the website was gonna look and really get everyone motivated about, like, you know, we have this really cool website with all these new features, like, stay tuned. So we develop a video really telling them, you know, why, why we're uh, developing a new website, what drove the redesign, the main features, and just like really like keep in touch, like, you know, check out our groups, and we're gonna have a new web website coming soon. That's great. Um, Susan, how about, how about you guys at, at Goodwin? How, how did the communication process work? Um, so we were a fairly uh, tight team um, doing the whole brand production, and our CMO, Nancy Kostakis, um, really led the charge in terms of the communication and the socialization with leadership and the partners. Um, and we, we really took the approach where we were going to get input from the business unit leaders. Um, so they were most interested, really, in the practice, the services area of the site. Um, so she and our marketing director um, both spent, um, did sessions with each of those groups and um, got their input and their feedback based on you know, some initial work that we had done. So we did an agile approach to this project, which meant we designed a section and we went in to build. And so um, and the, the, the services area was probably the most challenging because we were already like three quarters of the way through building it when it was be, being socialized. So there was a lot that we had to go back and do, um, but we were able to fit it all in. Um, you know, we also worked very closely with our recruiting team and our diversity and pro bono groups. Um, you know, sort of starting early from, you know, what are you looking for and keep thinking, you know, sharing wireframes with them. Even though we didn't really want to, we didn't have time to wait till we had design. Um, so we sort of moved them along through the process. Um, and, you know, really in our tight team is where we dealt with things that we had to make decisions to hold off on or compromises or, or whatever it was. So it was, I guess it would, in our case, it was using a tight team and everybody having a particular role in making things happen. Yeah. What, one of the things that I wanna mention is that when we were communicating, we really didn't uh, ask for feedback because what, what happened initially, we, wanted, we really wanted to be open and say, you know, please provide your feedback. But like Nate mentioned yesterday, some of the feedback that we got was like really uh, like, hmm, I don't know, there's something, like, well, can you explain more? Like, well, I don't know, it's just not clicking with me. Like, well, what does that mean, <laughs> right? <laughs> and it's like, well, I don't like the color. Well, like, we're green, like, the only color we can use, we can change it. So, you know, we, we determined that, you know, if we ask for feedback, I mean, we're just gonna get all these different mm -hmm. things, like a uh, different direction, and we're just gonna delay the launch. So our approach was, instead of asking for feedback, just tell them, you know, this is the process that we are following, and uh, these are the reasons that we are redesigning the website. These are the design trends that we're seeing in the marketplace. This is the results of the research that we did with your customers, because they provided a lot of customers. So, you know, here's the things that they want, why they come to the website, things that they don't like, and these are the wireframes in the design. So, I mean, we, we communicated the process, and I felt like after communicating that process and having a strategy, like really nobody had any, any pushback. Yeah, I mean, I think that's, oh, yeah, you have a question out here. That's a very good question. So we developed a video, it was two minutes long. And initially we had a meeting uh, with all the managing directors, directors, and associate directors. And we showed them that video in that conference that we had in, in Washington. So everybody knew what was going on. And then we also posted that video on Yammer. And then we sent an internal email to all the, all, to all the employees. Yeah. Um. I mean, both of these, both, both of what you're saying reminds, kind of reminds me 
what Joe presented on yesterday with that, uh, with really developing that narrative and how important it is to create alignment from the very beginning. Correct. Um, so really interesting. So um, you've both done this before. This year, uh, when you did the rebrand and the redesign process, that wasn't the first time that, you, that you've done this um, and taken on an intense project like that. Um, but it's different nowadays. We have more advanced technology. There's more capabilities, as we heard about yesterday, to really measure and analyze. Um, and the utility of digital and the utility of, the, uh, of our websites is increasing. So we're using it for more than just disseminating information, right? It's, it's a BD tool, essentially. So can you talk a, a little bit about, and Susan, if you wouldn't mind starting off, just talk about what was different this time around than, than when you've gone through this previously. Um, I think, you know, for, one of the things for me was just the level of sophistication of this firm from, um, versus the firm I had come from before. Um, in the firm I was at before, we really, there wasn't really anybody who knew <laughs> anything about digital. So it was very easy to make decisions and be very nimble. Um, in this firm, there are a lot of people who know a lot about a lot <laughs> and have very strong opinions. And so um, that was certainly that was certainly a challenge. Also, we were, go we were doing a responsive site and you know, there were design choices that would, um, would allow a very image heavy site like ours to um, easily, um, uh, you know, respond to, you know, the size of the screen. And I think that was hard for some of the people, at least in my group it, within the marketing department to understand that they may have some constraints on the kind of images that they could select and the composition of those images in order to be able to take that image from a huge full screen half you know half screen banner down to this big on a on a phone um, that was a, 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 I think a big challenge for us and certainly the timing you know I don't I don't recommend that anyone do a website of this magnitude in seven months <laughs> unless you're absolutely forced <laughs> great I think in my case is uh, the mindset and also moving away from one size really doesn't fit all. Like I remember when I started my career in developing the first website, we will always say, you know, this website is for architects, designers, and professionals. That's it. Now it's okay, this website is for Jane. Jane is a VP on the healthcare industry. Um, she consumes all her information on her way to work using her tablet. So we are really going and uh, like learning more about that person, her fears, her needs, what she wants, really uh, like developing different personas and then developing the content for every single persona that, that we develop, the scenarios, the outcomes, what we wanted that person to interact, you know, what devices, what information, really all the context from, from that person. She was moving away from all the demographics and really developing more personas that will really tell us and guide us on what to develop on the site and the content that we needed for each, for each persona. Yeah, that's great. And, and Susan, kind of coming back to you, I know a big part of what you guys did this time around was, was using analytics, um, not only during the, the process, but kind of increasing your use of analytics after the site launch. So can you talk a little bit about how analytics supported some of the decisions um, that you guys made throughout that? Um, sure. Uh, you know, during the process, um, I don't think we mentioned before that um, one of our other interesting wrinkles was that we used two firms to build the, to do the site. We used the, uh, d the brand agency to do the design working with One North to build. And um, so um, the other, the agency is the Martin Agency and they, um, they did a lot of work to look at our you know previous site and made a lot of recommendations based on that. Um, some of some of those recommendations were really aspirational, and we're still working towards those because our content didn't necessarily match um, where we wanted to be. You know, especially around the area of thought leadership. Um, 
And um, in terms of analytics today, um, when I came in, the, the, what people were doing was taking all the numbers out of Google Analytics, throwing them into a spreadsheet, not even doing a summary report. So we introduced a summary report, but then that got sent out to everyone. And it wasn't, nobody looked at it because it wasn't actionable. We didn't look at it, the web team. Um, so one of the things that we've done is try to not waste the time on just ca gathering data for data's sake and really honing in on the things that we care about. What do we want to know? We want to know if the homepage is performing to our goals. We want to know if the content that we have put tremendous amount of effort and positioning into is actually getting read. Um, so it's, you know, a much more, um, you know, dynamic kind of looking at analytics ad hoc um, and sharing that uh, with people. Um, in context. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I want to shift now to kind of talk a little bit about um, how you are both, because I know you're both doing this in different ways, but are both doing a great job at it. But how you're starting to really lay the groundwork for that kind of one to three year digital roadmap. And that's something you both started to do prior to launch. It wasn't something that. Um, that you, you, you started working on after the website project was done. It was something you, you started to um, lay the groundwork work, uh, for early. So can you talk a little bit about that, Gerardo, if you wouldn't mind kind of going first and, and talk about how you guys have done that and how, how it's been going? Yeah, so initially when we started the, the redesign, which was my, my first project, I have two people that were working more on the project management of the side, making sure that we were meeting all the different uh, timelines and the milestones. And then on my end, I was just working with uh, all the people in, in the company, with my boss, the CMO, developing like the vision that we had for, for uh, Navigant.com. Uh, so I worked directly with him, I worked directly with the director of communications, and then another person who works with uh, the CRM. So one of uh, the gaps that we had is that we have all these different systems that are not communicating with each other. Like we have Sidecore for the website, then we have Eloqua for CRM, uh, for, for marketing automation, and we have uh, another platform for CRM. And none of them are communicating. So when we were looking at that gap, we said, you know, our vision should really be connecting all these different um, t systems that we have and develop a one ecosystem so that we can have like a 365 de uh, degree view of all the customers that we have. So it was really working uh, in, in tandem of the website, but also at the same time working with different levels of the organization on the strategy, where we wanted to go, and the, uh, the budget that we needed, the roadmap, the enhancements that, that we needed. And really, it, it was very, very strategic, really uh, time consuming. And one, one of the things that since, since we were working on the, on the website at the same time, we were not even launched yet. And we already have a list like of 80 enhancements that we needed to do to the website once it was launched. So I mean, some people think that once you launch the website, you're done, and it's actually the opposite. You just start it. I mean, that website never ends. You have like once you launch, you already need to have like what's your vision moving forward, all the list of enhancements that you want to develop, uh, the the people that you need. Like in in our case, we we saw that I mean, one of the big gaps that we have, it's an analytics. I mean, we have one person that can pull all the reports from Google Analytics, but really what we need is like the analysis. What does this mean? I mean, it's just like, like numbers, and we don't understand those numbers, so we really need to understand what those numbers mean. That's great. Susan, how about for you, from your perspective, how did, how did that work out? Um, so, you know, similarly, uh, we had, you know, our master plan, um, for the site and with the time that we had um, to execute, we couldn't get to everything. There were entire modules that we had to put off um, and also compromises that we had to make along the way. And so, so the, the same, we started planning, okay, if we can't do that for launch, we're gonna do that for you know August 31st. And then this piece we wanna have by this time. And so it just all naturally started to flow into these two to three month releases where you know, we planned, planned it out and are you know, working with that. Um, 
and in, tar in you know, I would echo what uh, Harada said about um, the ecosystem. I'm, I'm curious, I have a follow-up question for you about um, what is, what's the understanding of the ecosystem and the need for the ecosystem within your firm? Is that something you educated them about or is that something they were already on board with and you were all kind of of like mind? So when I, when I got into the company, it was, they, they knew that nobody was using CRM. So there were talks about like using a new, a new CRM platform. But then I told them, well, you know, all these systems are not communicating. So it was just taking what they already had and just adding more, uh, more like the strategic context of how everything was going to be connected and work together, and the final outcome as well. Okay. So, um, yeah. So you know, ours is a little more. You know, those of us in the back end really understand the importance of all of those things being tied together. Um, we finished. You know, we didn't finish, but we kind of got through the web, the big part of the web. Part, um, site and then this year is CRM, um, and you know one of the one of our considerations. I mean, we were already a Sitecore user, but one of the things that we really liked about Sitecore is how we could integrate it with our CRM system. Ultimately, bring in a marketing automation t system, et cetera. So, you know, we we have the eye towards how that all connects uh, ultimately as well. Yeah, and, and I think one thing we, we always kind of tend to think that technology is going to solve all of our problems, but that's totally wrong. I mean, if you don't have the people that understand technology, that have the skills, and that really understand what's the final outcome, then technology is not going to solve anything. Right. Yeah. How about in the audience? Are there any, anybody that's started to kind of build out a, a program um, and would share maybe their experience with that, how it's gone, or what kind of ideas you've you know, any, any different perspectives on building out maybe a one to three year program for your digital assets? Anybody? Anybody? <laughs> Bueller? All right. Oh, here we go. Okay. You just need more time in the day. A couple more hours every day. Yeah. yeah. Allison, did you have something? <laughs> so it seems to me, and obviously I've been intimately involved with both um, Navigant and Goodwin, <clears throat> it seems to me that having an, an accelerated timeline actually helps catalyze the notion of moving from one website project to a program because it enables you to say, well, we have a limited amount of time, a limited budget, therefore everything else gets pushed to a phase two or phase three or subsequent releases and it sort of helps shift that mindset. Do you guys have any recommendations for someone who may not have that kind of artificial deadline um, to help shift into that program mindset? Um, I think budget is a really, a, a really, really critical thing because I think as it was mentioned yesterday, in that bimodal idea, the firm thinks, oh, I make this huge investment and then I don't have to think about it again for five years. But you know, you in our case, we were switching over to the new version of Sitecore, all new brand, all new that. So it was a giant ticket, and so budgeting this year was really. Um, a challenge to get the money that we needed to keep going. And um, so I guess if you're not on that kind of timeline, it might be worthwhile to, like we saw, look at that line that isn't the big humps, but look at a more, you know, sort of 
can sit, you know, sort of um, smoothed out development cycle and budget accordingly and, and do the education of, you know, your department and, and the firm leadership and all of that to understand that you're going to want a consistent investment as opposed to these huge spikes. Yeah. Hi, uh, Catherine Militis from Better Price. Um, you guys, when you find that you add capability, when you add the analytics, or when you add a CRM integration, doesn't that always in, uh, involve headcount ads? I mean, don't you always have to have the FTE then, the guy who does analysis, the people who add the CRM capability? Um, that's what I'd like to hear about. Yeah, so in, in my, my case, like, like one of the huge gaps is analytics. So yeah, absolutely, I need to hire somebody that really understands uh, analysis and like numbers that they have to analyze. So yeah, I mean, I will definitely have to hire someone. And also another gap that we have is that I manage the graphics team. But most of the times, those uh, people and designers are working on PDFs which PDFs are horrible, I just want to kill the PDF. <laughs> but I, I, I really want them to, re, uh, to develop like more interactive assets to tell a consistent and visual story on the website. And I don't have those skills right now in my team, so I need to hire somebody as well for, uh, to develop those kind of graphics. Yeah. Oh, and in addition, actually, I, I used to also hire one content strategist because we also, one of our gaps was content. Uh, I mean, we don't produce a lot of content, and when we produce content, it's really not tied to a campaign or a problem. It's just like, like one piece that is not related to anything. So we decided that we really needed a content strategy, so she started probably one month ago. Do either of you outsource any of the analytics or design work um, to an entity that has you know, contract workers that would work for you? Um, so in the analytics area, um, we hired an SEO consultant to work with us, both on driving traffic and to help us with analytics. And I think that's a good way to start because you don't have to add the headcount. You can start to show the benefit and people get used to seeing that information and you start to have the results. And then they say, and then when you need the headcount, you, it's, you can say, well, you know, we want to do more with this. Um, and one of, a, one of the strategies that, that we have with the data analyst is that um, we, too, see the need for that. And um, we see that person working across all marketing data. So you know, that same person that's doing the analytics for the website can do the analytics of the CRM and what is the ROI on our different programs and, and things like that. And so when you spread it across all data within the marketing department, I think you can make a better case for it. Um, and in terms of graphics, you know, we are really tight. We have two graphics people, and we have a hugely image-heavy site. Um, we weren't able to get an extra headcount. We have, during the brand production, we used Outsource to help us just get over the, the hurdle. Um, one of the things that we did is, is um, I don't know if you use one of these office services outsourcing companies, like we use Williams Lee, and we're able to use their, um, their, their uh, production team, they have some people with some decent Photoshop skills. And so for routine stuff that isn't like super creative, but it's like image resizing or cropping or whatever, we give that to them. So we're able to spread that out a little bit more. So we, we just have to be creative on how we can find bodies. And my colleague and I, you know, pick up Photoshop and <laughs> figure out how to do it when we need to. All right, um, so we have about uh, 10 minutes left, but I, I do wanna hear, we've, we've talked about how you've kind of um, created these roadmaps, right? Like the, the one to three year plan. I wanna hear how that's been going because I think we've already um, agreed on the fact that it's, it's challenging, right? And when, when you're trying to sell that through um, with things like budgets and stakeholders, that's, that's a challenge. So uh, Gerardo, if you wouldn't mind, kind of talking about how it's going for you guys so far. So I don't know if it's the good thing or the bad thing is that we don't really have like the mindset of digital. So every time I come up with a plan, I mean, people like are very receptive, they take it, so I don't 
usually get a lot of pushback. So in that regard, it's, it's a good thing. I mean, I'm developing right now my plan for, for three years, but again, I mean, it's digital, everything changes every, every day. So I mean, I just have that map just like to help me for, for the vision, but it will always be changing. Like we were gonna review it every single month and then change things, move things apart, add budget, if we have budget, or just like move things around. But really that roadmap, it was more like, like giving us like the vision of what we wanted to do and when we were gonna be doing it. That's great. Susan, how about, how about for you? How, how's it been working out? Um, so, you know, we had a long enough list post-launch to keep us pretty busy for the first six months to a year. Um, and, you know, there's, there's one mo module that we didn't get to that we really want to do. And as we were, our, our fiscal year ends September 30th. So as we were in budget time, you know, we, our first indication was that our budget was going to be cut by two thirds um, for the web. And how are we ever going to do that module? So one of the things that, that we had to do was kind of have a plan A and plan B. So plan A is as we originally expected to, to launch that. And plan B was how do we accomplish that same goal, maybe doing part of it this year and part of it the next year. So it's just constantly being creative and thinking how can I, how can I get this very important facet of, this, of the site done um, and you know, within the budget I have. And I'm sure everybody here has the, you know, the people within your firms that have this brilliant idea and they suck up all your money um, with this brilliant idea that really has no strategic benefit. It's just like, I saw this and it's cool, we should do it. Um, so you have to become really resilient to that where in the past we did a lot of caving and sometimes we still have to. But um, when it comes to dollars, I think we're much more, you know, we're much more forceful in terms of saying, let's not waste the dollars that we have. Um, so there's no shortage of things that we want to do, and we're learning every day. We're not even six months released, and already we're talking about, okay, how do we want to modify the home page? How do we want to plan for, you know, going from sort of practice-based thought leadership to topic-based thought leadership, and what's the critical mass, and working with our content team toward getting to that goal, you know, and then what does that do to the site, so... And I think in my case, so, so we have that huge list of enhancements that we have. So we decided that it was better to score each one. So we take every enhancement and then we add a score and say, okay, will this enhancement uh, improve the user experience? What's the level of effort? How much does it cost? Is it really gonna have a huge impact? So we take every single enhancement and then we score it through all these different categories. And then that really helps us out to prioritize what do we need to do first? Mm -hmm. That's great. Um, okay, so I wanna hear a little bit about, we, we talked a lot, Kathy and Mitch talked yesterday a lot about measuring and, and analyzing and how um, data analytics should really kind of support what the strategy is um, and, and some of those enhancements that we're pursuing. So I'd love to hear just about how you guys are starting to use um, analytics more to kind of measure um, and optimize moving forward. Um, so, uh, Susan, if you wouldn't mind kind okay. of talking about that first. Um, you know, so I, I just mentioned that, you know, we're already looking at um, changes that we want to do to the home page, and that's purely analytics driven. You know, we had, you know, we put these amazing case studies top of the, of the page um, to tell a certain story about our firm, and um, and we have another spot on the home page as you kind of scroll through that where these are really the showcase and the numbers just aren't there. People aren't clicking on them. And, you know, there's a couple of things that, you know, may, that we can tweak uh, easily, but um, in terms of just getting people to click through, but, um, you know, it's also an indicator to us that we have to go back and, and rationalize that strategy and say, you know, we need, to know, we need to understand the users a little bit better and what motivates them and, you know, because a lot of work goes into that stuff. Yeah. And we better make sure that all that work is paying off for us. Yeah. Like Kyle said yesterday, it helps us really spend time on what's working, yeah. right? Yeah. And whose bio got clicked on the most, 
it's irrelevant, really. <laughs> you know, it's, it's those things that hit, you know, that are connected to our strategy that are so important that we look at. The rest is just a sea of not useful information necessarily. Gerardo, how about it? So in our case, so we're using uh, analytics to decide what the, the things that we need to change after launch. So for example, the careers page went through, a, it's, a, it's totally different. We really wanted to tell a story of why join Navigant, tell the stories of the people that are working uh, currently at the, at the company. So it was really a whole story and at the end of the page, it was the apply for a job. Well, we saw that after we launched, people were not clicking on apply. So what we did was just, we, we left everything intact. We just take the CTA, the call to action, and put it on the top. And then that little change increased our uh, applications again. So just like really telling or like running your report, seeing what's working, what's not, and then just taking actions right away. Yeah. Yeah. That's nimble. Being right. Nimble. Yeah, and then one, one other thing is that when we started the project, I always wanted to sell the project as like a mobile first approach because people are constantly checking their, their phones, their tablets, and people were really like just looking at me like, well, why? I mean, really, are people using their cell phones or their tablets? Like, yeah, it's 2016. Yeah, they are doing it. <laughs> <laughs> so now that we, now we saw that from August since we launched until today, and uh, the people that have come to the site through mobile have increased 17%. Oh. So it's oh. huge. Yeah. Yeah. So now we're, we have the data saying, you know, this is the reason why we always need to take the mobile first approach. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, Susan, you said nimble, and I, I think that's definitely what jumps out to me is that ability to pivot quickly. Yeah. And um, Kyle mentioned that too yesterday. If, if we can embrace that kind of more evil, uh, even playing for the, um, endurance cycle that allows us to do that. So that's a great example. Thank you. Um, we have a question. Thank you. So how do you start incorporating data in your day-to-day -day operations and taking those numbers to make informed decisions? You know, how did you start doing that? Just your resources or? So, you know, it's really seat of the pants, to be honest. Um, I don't have anybody to analyze the data and present it to me, so I'll go into Google Analytics, click around, I know what we're trying to do, and um, you know, just, and, and tell stories. And then um, one of the things that uh, we put in place with the new site is um, two groups, an editorial board and a content strategy group. And so these are, um, cross-functional groups within our marketing department. So we have communications, marketing slash content, digital, um, as well as, pe as um, people from BD, from business development. And, you know, um, and what I try to do is we're focused in those um, meetings on strategic content. And so I just bring some raw numbers in. We, we have a sort of a summary of here's everything that's on the site, here's what's in the pipeline, and in addition to sort of like this is what it is, this is what industry it's for, this is what practice it's for, um, this is how long it's been up, it's also, and these are how many page views we've gotten in that period of time. So we have a quick dashboard snapshot and we're all looking at the full picture um, of the content, um, you know, as we're we're talking about, you know, this is going to be the greatest thing, you know, we bring it to the table and say, well, you know, here's how it did on email, here's how it did, but it's it like I said, it's seat of the pants. I want to get to the day where I have somebody that can pull that together, and we can be even more strategic. But until then, just grab the numbers and tell the story is what I try to do with my co colleagues. Yeah, I will say the same thing because I don't have anyone that can like really pull the, the data. However, right now that we have the content strategist, uh, what she does, it's every time somebody wants to write something, she starts, okay, what is your goal? What do you want to do? Like, what's your main objective? What are your KPIs? And then after that, measure uh, and per, and the performance and then start, start testing and then changing based uh, in order to get to those KPIs. Great. Um, well, I think we're at time, um, but 
Susan and Gerardo, thank you so much for being willing to participate this morning and, and hey, really Alex, just share. We still yeah. have a little bit of time if there's questions from the audience. Okay. I'll I mean, save that wrap up I, until unless, later. You know, I know yeah. you want to let everyone off the hook, but. No, no. Are there any questions? Joe in the back there. Has, oh. Client first. <laughs> uh, you both touched on um, the navigating the stakeholder feedback process a little bit earlier, but I wanted to ask, you know, Ryan Horner yesterday brought up kind of the, the hippo effect, the highest uh, paid person's opinion, and how that dynamic can be tricky, and I think a lot of firms uh, struggle to kind of mitigate that dynamic when it sort of rears its ugly head in a project. And I'm just curious if that came into play at all um, with your builds, and just if it did, sort of how you how you got around it. So that's a really good question. We have there's always one person in a company that everybody is super scared of that person. It has a lot of influence, <laughs> <laughs> and of course, nobody gave me a heads up. <laughs> so yeah, we have that that happening at, at, at when we were relaunching the site. But really, I mean, we just tell them, you know, we have a really tight deadline. We understand what you want to do. We're just going to put it on the list of enhancements, and we're going to investigate and let you know a timeline. So yeah, I mean, we, we take uh, their feedback in consideration. We put it on the enhancement list. We prioritize. And then if it's something that we can do right away, we do it. Otherwise, it just keeps on in the list. And then one of the really good things is that my boss, a CMO, he's very, very supportive. And I tell him like things that are going right, things that are going wrong, and he's always very supportive. And I mean, every time I have an issue, I just go with him, and he he helps me handle it. Any other questions? Any other questions? Okay. All right. Looks like that's a wrap. Thanks, Great. Alex, well, thank Susan, you, and Gerardo. Yeah.